If you have your Bibles, I invite you to join me in that text that Peter, or a Peter, I'm sorry, PJ, I, I'm going to start off embarrassing myself, foot firmly placed within mouth that PJ read, and I'm sorry about that, just a moment ago. As we begin to discuss this idea of submission, I think I need to make my intentions known to you because of what we're up against culturally and even in the church. The spirit of the age has polluted this idea so much so that most of us have either had bad experiences with this idea of submission or we don't know what it is and therefore we're kind of afraid of it. And I think that's even like coming from the top. When PJ and I were talking earlier this week that there are some denominational figureheads and and pretty prominent Christian leaders in America that that won't touch this with a 10-foot pole because I think it it, it belies the fact that they either are are afraid of the controversy surrounding it or they don't understand it. And and I don't want to be guilty of that. Um, I also want you to know I'm not trying to be clever this morning. I'm not trying to take something that the world doesn't want to talk about and make it more palatable for you. My aim is simple, and it really is the same thing week in and week out, but my aim is your understanding because of what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you abide in my words and my words abide in you, then you are truly my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And so this is all about truth and us abiding in the truth of Jesus. And at the same time, I also realize that it can be a delicate subject. As I said, it's been polluted by the spirit of the age, and so confusion abounds. But the truth of the matter is, there have been some hurts, whether by the church or by uh, family members. And so, you know, abuse abounds too. And people have hurts that they carry around. So we need to be accurate. And I think I've made that plain. We discovered last week in verse 21, which we read again just a few moments ago, that we are mutually called to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And that really serves as a platform for us all the way through chapter 6 and verse 9. When we address wives and husbands and children and and even uh, like the employer-employee relationship that's coming in chapter 6, all of that is kind of built upon this foundation of what we labeled as humility. And here's why we called it that. This idea of submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's because we are willingly letting go of our rights, our expectations. We are surrendering our me-first attitude. And, And that really is what submission is all about. It is putting ourselves under. That's literally what the word Means It is putting ourselves under someone else. And as we do, we are surrendering the I'm going to get mine kind of outlook on life. We're putting our needs, our expectations, our freedoms, our rights under that of others. I, I hope we're in agreement on that. And that said, there are some general principles that we need to cover that will serve as foundation stones as we try to understand this sensitive topic, they will carry us through the rest uh, of, of this chapter and into chapter six. And so let's look at these general principles together concerning submission. Number one is this. Practically speaking, submission is a product of being filled with the Holy Spirit. It really is a fruit. You could say it that way. And you can jump back up to verse 18 where we're told not to get drunk with wine, where it's an excess or debauchery. We're not to go overboard and, and go too far with that. Instead, if you're going to go too far, be filled with the Spirit. And, and this, there's a sense in which this concept of submission is actually an outcome of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's, a, it's unfortunate as we kind of wrap our minds around this and we just get the lay of the land, that you know what's true about us is that we often revert to the lowest common denominator around us, meaning that depending on who we're around, we've so compartmentalized our lives that 
there's little difference between us and the world. There's little difference between our former manner of life and who we are now in Christ. And I don't say that uh, as a means of condemnation. I just, I'm trying to bring out the fact that that's especially true with regard to submission. That there's little difference in many of us, if not all of us, between our former manner of life and our new self in Christ when it comes to this idea of submission. And the reason is, is that we're not constantly hitting the refresh button on being filled with the Spirit. That the Spirit is in us, but the Spirit doesn't have all of us. This is so incredibly important for us. This is the key to understanding and living out biblical submission, and it starts with being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so let's just, matter of fact, say some things here. That's, these are very important over the next few weeks. Given the nature of our subject, a wife, since we are talking about wives submitting to their husbands, a wife who does not first understand her obligation to submit to the Holy Spirit and then to her husband has no biblical expectation of godly leadership from her husband. And the same is also true from the other side. A husband who demands his wife's submission without first recognizing the fact that he is supposed to submit first to the Holy Spirit and be filled with the Holy Spirit has, and then submit to his wife through, through leading her and, and sacrificially loving her like Christ loves the church has no right, no biblical right to expect his wife to submit. The same is true for parents. Now, last week when we were talking about submission, we were talking about putting another need, uh, another's needs first, and, and there's a sense in which Jesus Christ, who took your sin and mine on the cross, submitted to our needs first above his own glory. And the same principle applies to us as parents and grandparents, parents who demand obedience from their children but do not first recognize their need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and the requirement of their submission to one another out of reverence for Christ cannot function as godly parents and have no reasonable expectation of wholehearted obedience. I hope we're on the same page here. This is critically important. Practically speaking, biblical submission begins with being filled with the Holy Spirit. Secondly, and holistically, submission is God's design. And we often think about this in terms of, of rank and of authority and of power, but that is not the case. And you may recall, actually, that the word submit here is the Greek word hubitasso, and it literally has a military connotation to it that implies some form of rank. However, I want you to listen to me because this is important. The only rank belongs to Christ who is the head. And that's the only rank. We are all one in Christ, Galatians 3, 28, and there is no rank between us, no power structure, even though it might be hierarchical and there are gifts given specifically, but that is by design. It is to fulfill God's purpose. It does not suggest that one person dominates another, that one person holds the power while the other person holds no power. That's not what this is. That this is mutual and it's a misfire and a complete misunderstanding and misrepresentation to think about this in terms of authority or power. We should be thinking in terms of design. And, and when we start thinking in terms of design, you better start thinking of your body. You better start thinking about the laws that govern creation, that God programmed into the universe, that there are certain things that he designed and set in motion that are supposed to be that way according to his will, not ours. And, and that, by the way, is foundational for our understanding going forward. And so hear, hear me on this. Not only are my rights and freedoms subordinate to the common good of the body of Christ, but my rights and my freedoms are also subordinate to the well-being of my wife and my children. That's what submission is. And in that way, I mutually submit to my wife and to my children. 
I, I hope, and by the way, because this is God's design, anytime you kind of see this laid out in the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 7 and 11, and we go back to the creation story in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, there is design. And so this is how God designed the family to flourish. Mutual fellowship through submission out of reverence for Christ. By the way, this is how church works best, and this is how society works best, too. There is a lot in the scriptures about willing submission to governmental authorities and to church leadership as well. Not about power, not about rank and authority. We're all one in Christ. It's about design, and that design fulfills God's purpose. Are we in agreement on that? So, that said, the best example of this, once again, is found in none other than Jesus Christ. And so start thinking with me about the Trinity for a minute. This, this idea that God is three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yet, while distinct, different in form and function, they are absolutely equal in character and essence. And that is sound doctrine. But think this thing through because Christ, John 1, 1, Christ was in the beginning with God and Christ was God. That he was one with the Father, John 10, 30. That he was in the Father and the Father was in him, John 14, 11. Nevertheless, the Son was submissive to his Father, John 5, 30. John 15, 10. John 20 and 21. In Luke chapter 2, we are told that Jesus Christ was submissive to his earthly parents. The eternal Son of God submitted himself and obeyed his earthly parents. John 5, 19, Jesus said, I can do nothing apart from the Father. And, and, and all, what does that prove? When we start taking that apart and we're looking at, looking at this through the lens of the Trinity, what does that prove? That means that the Son was and remains submissive to the Father in function while being completely equal with Him in nature. That, that, that this, isn't, this can't be then, this cannot be about power or rank or authority because Jesus said, all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. It belongs to Him. It is through his powerful word. It is by his own authority that the world we know it as we know it exists. So this is willing. This is a mutual submission where one party agrees to it by design to fulfill God's purpose, to fulfill God's will. And so then that brings us to number three here. Ideally, submission is mutual and I've already hinted at this, but here's where the spirit of the age begins to infect our thinking. That the spirit of the age says that a marriage is a partnership where it's 50-50. But hear me out on that. That is an invitation for you to keep score. If it's supposed to be 50-50, one day you give 48 and your partner gives 52 and just like that, the scales are tipped in her or his favor and, and the, the, you guys start keeping score. And that, that's, that's really how that works. And that's a misrepresentation of how this, this idea of submission works. And then this idea of give and take. Well, what if I give more than I take? And then my flesh rises up in me and I start feeling entitled. Anybody else admit to that in church? And the church has taken that and baptized it and, 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 and tried to, to sanctify it and said, well, it requires 100% from both parties. But, but even that is a misrepresentation because it's only partly true. Yes, all of you is required. Yes, you need to be 100% bought in, but that's not the whole story. Submission is not just we come together and we agree on I get my needs here and you get your needs there. Submission is you always come first. This begins to challenge our thinking here. If we are mutually submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, and we are coming together, it brings everybody to the table in mutual agreement that the needs of others always come before my own. 
That's the only way this works. And this isn't an invitation for you to allow yourself to be trampled on or for you to never get what you want because our flesh always starts to respond that way. We start always wondering about what if and this scenario and so and so. That's not what this is. It works best when both parties are in agreement. And it's really the only way this really works and brings health and and wholeness to the home when there is a mutual agreement between both parties where they have turned toward the father, both parties, husband and wife, and said, your will be done. When both parties, husband and wife, turn toward Christ and say, you are preeminent in this home. You sit on the throne, not me. When they turn toward the spirit and in an act of surrender, they say, you have the lead. That's the kind of mutuality we're talking about here, and it begins with that. Otherwise, one person dominates and the other person tries to control, and that is the curse of sin. And so this mutuality is we are coming together, everybody to the table, man, woman, children. We're all in agreement on what God's will is. We're all in agreement about who has authority. We're all in agreement about who has leadership and preeminence, and therefore, We can humble ourselves, let go of our rights, stop demanding our own freedoms and privileges, and put the needs of others above our own. And that's a a wonderful blessing. And we need to get this right. Can I get a witness on that? We need to get this right. And so with those foundation stones laid, we can turn our attention to the specifics given to wives. Look back with me at the text, if you will. Because us reading this text through Western eyes and as moderns, it seems a little odd to begin with wives. And, and if that seems odd to you, you're not alone because it does for me. And that's just simply culture influencing my interpretation of the text. However, without going into a great amount of detail, we need to think about those who read this letter first. But this body of believers in Ephesus, where there were Jewish people who had been part of that synagogue and who had been dispersed throughout the Roman Empire. There are people who are Roman citizens who have been highly influenced by the Greeks before them, and all of that stuff is coming together. And without going into a a great amount of detail, if you were a Jew in the first century, it's unfortunate, probably will offend you a little bit, But women were little more than servants. They were not educated, never taught how to read, expected to be keepers at home and bear children. Greek society was worse still. A wife's sole purpose in Greek culture was to bear children. That's it. Everything else transpired outside of the marriage. Any kind of sexual fulfillment and gratification was outside of marriage. And so the wife's sole purpose was simply to be, forgive me for being crass, an incubator, and to carry on the family name. Roman culture was worse still, where marriage was more or less legalized prostitution. Divorce was rampant. There was no sanctity of the home. There was this competitive, rivalrous spirit in some kind of weird parallel to our day, and, and I, again, without going into great amount of detail, that those, those cultural norms were the situation where, that the Holy Spirit is speaking this truth into. And, and there, are, there are a great amount of applications that we can make from that to our own. Because when I think about those things and I read that, and the, the list is long, I get offended. I start to squirm a little bit. It bothers me. How could that be the case? But what it really does is it highlights the importance of the gospel in society. Because when Jesus came along and began to preach the kingdom of heaven, through the preaching of the gospel, those cultural norms were torn down. They they began to roll back. This is so incredibly important. And so this admonishment towards submission to to the people who read this letter first and to us who are reading it now is a call to live in total contrast to what is normative in culture. 
Do you, do you look at me for a minute. Do you want to stand out from the crowd? Because that seems to be our kind of our goal, and we, we want everybody to think that we're unique. We want to, we want people to notice how different we are, and there's all these different things. Do you want to stand out from the crowd? Keep yourself pure for marriage. Be the husband of one wife. Be the wife of one husband. Till death do you part. Raise children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You'll stand out if you do those things. And it's not rocket surgery, as my sister says. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's right here in black and white for us. And as new people then, the relationship between husband and wife is sacred. It's not secularized. It's not... Uh, sensualized like we find in the spirit of the age. It is sacred, modeled after Christ's own love for his church. And so when Christ enters the home then, through the, through the gospel, by faith in the gospel, the home, the relationship first between man and woman and then with their children, becomes an outpost for his kingdom. It is where the kingdom is felt first in society. And as such, it should be bathed in humility and clothed in grace. And in the power of Christ's kingdom, please hear me on this. This is so important. Mutual submission out of reverence for Christ begins to undo what transpired in the fall because of sin. If you were to go back with me to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16, that this, this alienation and discord caused by the fall can be undone in the power of the Spirit when both parties come together in agreement and mutually submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That, that desire to be contrary that is part of the curse and that desire to dominate and control is overcome when we put away our former manner of life and we put on the new self that is recreated after righteousness and true holiness and we walk in submission that we are literally undoing the curse. And so in this particular case, concerning wives first, by God's design... Wives are called to willingly place themselves under their husbands. Now, here's how we apply that according to the text. Submission is limited to the covenant of marriage. Look back with me. Submit, wives, submit to your own husbands. You see that? And so this is not something we apply generally we don't overlay this principle over society as a whole. We don't overlay this principle even over the church as a whole. It is specifically for the covenant of marriage. It is between a wife and her husband. It is her voluntary response to God's will, giving up her rights to herself, choosing to serve her husband just as Jesus did. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 20 and 28. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. If Jesus can do it, so can you. Hello? By the way, it needs to be said here, this is not a command to obey. This idea of submission is not obedience. It's a completely different word that we'll use in reference to children obeying their parents. A completely different word it, when, that is used in reference to servants obeying their masters. This, is, it, this suggests intimacy within a marriage. And I'll explain. That as a wife willingly submits to the one with whom she has become one flesh, that is a true picture of Christ's love for the church. They belong to each other with absolute equality. There is no superiority. There is no inferiority. In fact, this, this complementary relationship that we see patterned in creation, they need each other. They, they, you need each other. And, and I know this is so foreign to our culture where each party wants to stand on their own two feet, have their own income, have their own career, do their own thing, mind their own business. You might as well be roommates. That's not one flesh. But there's this, this idea of submission 
where both parties are coming together, this, this is really an intimate thing because God is joining together into one that which used to be two. And when two sinners come together, there has to be mutual submission for there, be, there to be agreement. Amen? And secondly, submission is also out of reverence for Christ. Now, we know this, but look with me at verse 23, the last part of verse 22. I don't mean to be redundant, but I'm probably going to beat this drum every week for the next couple of weeks, okay? But this is out of reverence for Christ. This is as to the Lord. You see that in verse 22? It is as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, don't fall back on this idea of authority and power and rank. We've already, we've already worked through that. And this is as to the Lord because Christ is head. So who is the example that we are to follow? Men and women together, who is the example? Christ is. Jesus Christ, your Savior, who performed for you the supreme act of submission, dying on the cross for you, taking your sin upon himself for you, giving you his righteousness for you. That is the supreme act of submission. He is the example. He is the Savior of the church. He is the head of the church. He is the head of the home, too. This idea of headship, we often get, get caught up in, in who's the head, and, and Christ is the head. You understand that? If, if two believers, men and women, are both believers in the home, Christ is the head. And therefore, submission is qualified by that phrase, as to the Lord. Here's, here's where this gets important for us as we try to apply this accurately. That a wife's submission to her husband is a manifestation first of her submission to Christ as her Lord and Savior. That there are two prevailing thoughts here worth mentioning. One, this is not some kind of social contract where, where this is a duty placed on you because you signed a marriage license or that it is the expectation of your family or the expectation of your church that this responsibility is placed upon you ladies by Christ Jesus himself. And that's not an overstatement. This is as to the Lord. Secondly, the expectation that you submit to your own husband is to do that only as you can do that to the Lord. Allow me to explain. If your husband ever requires disobedience to Christ from you, then you are under no obligation whatsoever to submit to your husband. In the same way that when the government expects disobedient to Christ from you, civil disobedience is expected for those who walk by faith and not by sight. Does that make sense? Again, this brings us back to the fact that Jesus is the head. Christ is the head. We should always choose to obey first Jesus because he is head, he is Savior, he is Lord. Are we in agreement about that? Thirdly, submission is not circumstantial. Look with me at verse 24. As the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now, I know we're, please don't get uncomfortable here. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching and instruction. And you understand? This is scripture. So this imperative, as I said earlier, brings everybody to the table. And no one is exempt because of their circumstances. That it's never one-sided. The expectation is that there never be one-sided submission where the husband doesn't submit and the wife has to do all of the submitting. That is not what's being said here. And, and by the way, the opposite is also true. It isn't the expectation that the wife get to, to do culturally whatever she wants while the husband is responsible to do everything. There's mutuality here. And so submission is never one-sided. It is assumed 
then that there is a mutual filling of the Spirit, that there is a mutual reverence for Christ, that there is a mutual agreement on what the will of the Lord is for the home. Therefore, we can say confidently and with certainty, according to the Scripture, that wives are expected to submit to their husbands in everything. And that's how it's quantified, meaning that it's not circumstantial. God's design and purpose is not for the exaltation of man and the humiliation and suppression of women, nor vice versa. This is God's design for blessing and for good and for protection upon the home. It is for the satisfaction of husband and wife and the sanctification of both man and woman as he created them to be. Can I, can I say something plainly to you? That... that Christ will never fully be formed in you until we get this right. We cannot cordon this off and leave this unaffected by the gospel. That Christ will never fully be formed in us until there is mutual submission out of reverence for Christ. Wives submit to their own husbands as unto the Lord, and husbands love their wives as Christ loved the church. We're coming. Guys, you're going to get it in a couple of weeks. Don't worry. There's far more said to you in this text than there is to the ladies. So buckle up. But please, please hear me on this. This is, this is a mutual submitting as unto the Lord in everything. Not, not, we don't have any reason at all to do it when it's comfortable only or when it's convenient only or when it's desirable only. That, that we are serving the Lord Christ in this way. And then finally, submission is an effective apologetic for the faith. A couple of outside texts here I want to share with you. First is, uh, is from 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2, where wives are told to be subject, same word that we have here in Ephesians, to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may, may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Can, can you look at me for a minute? That a humble and gracious spirit in the face of cultural adversity is a powerful testimony to unbelieving members of the household. That this is the exact opposite of browbeating and nagging and criticizing and even preaching that, that specifically applied to the relationship between wives and their husbands. Perhaps it goes without saying, but this once again demonstrates the truth of Christ's lordship in your life. And that the same principle applies, said later on down in 1 Peter 3, that we ought always to be ready to give an answer to those who ask of us, for the reason, for the hope that is within us with gentleness and respect, that we don't go out into the world as salt and light and browbeat people into the kingdom. And that's not the expectation at home. As passionate as, that, as you are, as, as much as you desire for your unbelieving spouse to come into the faith, you will not win them by nagging them into the kingdom. But you will win them with your gracious and humble spirit. Walking in submission is a way for your lights to shine at home, for the unbelieving members of your household to see your good works and to give glory to your Father in heaven. Secondly, I want you to look at Titus 2 with me as we continue to try to understand this idea that submission is an apologetic for the faith. There we're told in verse 3, older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, Slaves to much wine, they are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. So here we have a pattern, and it's an important one. It's kind of lost in the American West where we have a nuclear family and the two parents working outside the home. And by the way, I need to say this too. I'm not advocating that... That, that every wife stay home and be a stay-at-home mom. If that's what God has called you to do, I applaud you. 
I do. But that's not what this is about. That, that this pattern is that older women are to train the younger women by example first and then to train them with teaching about the priorities of home life. Do you see that? That this is there to show and to teach what a Christian home looks like. They are to train younger women how to love their husbands and their children, how to submit to their own husbands, and how to manage their own affairs at home. This is divinely assigned labor. It's a high calling, and it is work. It's not, this isn't demeaning at all. This is elevating. Now, this is an honorable calling, and the expectation is faithfulness here, not perfection. And so, we have a lot to learn here because our families have become so segmented. And, and I'll, I'll use my own family as an example, that, that both of my parents are with the Lord, and, and my, my grandparents on my mom's side are, are dead, and, and my grandfather on my father's side is dead, and, and I don't really have a relationship with my grandmother on, on my father's side. And so there is, there is no paternal influence there or maternal influence on me and my sister. And, and so where do I find that kind of community then? That kind of influence, that kind of training. I have to turn to the body of Christ where there are scores of older men who have stepped in and serve as grandparents to my children and even father figures to me. And that's true for my wife as well, that there are scores of older ladies in this room sitting under the sound of my voice that have stepped into that void. And the imperative here is that when the body of Christ comes together, we don't turn to the world to find this. We find it in the church where whatever is missing and whatever is lacking in the home, the church comes together and that void is filled. And that there is a modeling of what the Christian home looks like, that there is training. And by the way, this doesn't have to be formulaic. You don't have to sit down with a book and answer question one and question two. And if that works for you, bravo, but that's not what I'm saying that this really is a call to live life together as the body of Christ. And I've, I've learned more across the dinner table from, from, from some of you than I ever have from a book. Hello? Is that, that's so true, isn't it? And so this pattern then becomes critically important. And it's a wonderful defense for the faith. And I would say this before we close. It really is a powerful way to ensure that your children grow up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. If you want to hand your faith down to your kids, this is a great place to start by modeling this at home. I know we have a lot to navigate here. And we have a lot of things that are going on in culture to set aside and a lot of preconceived ideas to set aside and maybe a lot of hurts that need to be set aside as well. So it's important that we agree that we are going to orient our souls around the Scripture, that the Scriptures are going to anchor us in the midst of this culture of ours, that we're going to turn to the Bible, to God's Word. We're going to lean on the Holy Spirit for understanding. We're not going to lean on our own because God and His Word have not changed that this is still the expectation for the church in America in 2024. Amen? And we are called to put away our former manner of life in which we put ourselves first. That's where we start. And we put on our new self where we are putting others first. We can do this. It's not unreasonable we can do it in the power of Christ and in the mind of Christ. We can do as he did. So, what needs to be put away? Here, I'll ask you again. What needs to be put away from our former manner of life? Is it some hurt that you've been carrying around? because of some unreasonable expectations somewhere along the way? 
maybe you've been taught error and you need to put that away because there's a lot of that going around too. And in its place, you need to clothe yourself with the truth of the gospel that all are one in Christ. Christ is the head. And so we can mutually submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Amen? What do we need to put on then? Let's all stand to our feet as we're thinking about those questions together. We're not just trying to put away the things of the world, we're trying to put on Christ. So I'm gonna trust the Holy Spirit to convince you of the truth as we pray. Father, I pray that you would help us today to first to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That we would willingly lay down our me first, I want mine attitude. That we would willingly accept and receive the mind of Christ who put others before himself, even before the glory and worship that he was due so that he could serve and become our savior. I pray that you would help my sisters in this room to see the truth of your word. Holy Spirit, illuminate their hearts, teach them, proclaim to them the things that belong to Christ. And I pray that you'd be glorified by every member of the home coming together in agreement about what your will is. We give you praise, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.